you, Jan, for giving us this opportunity to go through your book, Don't Get Too Excited, where you tell us about your experiences in life, and many of us find ourselves in situations very similar. So tell us, how, how did you start this? So it all began uh, in the fall of 2012. I was a part of a writer's group at work. Um, it was more of a creative outlet for us. It, it's, you know, I work for a media company and it's a creative space, but we were looking for something outside of our day-to-day -day roles um, to be able to be uh, supportive to each other as a creative outlet. Um, and I was very intimidated <laughs> about our first writer's group meeting um, because my day-to-day -day job is more of an operational role and that's really how everyone knew me as the problem solver, the pragmatic one. Um, so I was very nervous about showing my um, creative side, um, so to speak. Um, and so I wrote a piece about shoes. Um, I had been going through um, a, uh, a bout of plantar fasciitis <laughs> um, and was wearing, you know, orthotics and more sensible shoes. And I thought, oh, I'm just rattling off this silly piece 20 minutes before we convene for the first time and everyone's going to think it's ridiculous and um, but in fact they didn't because it really had a lot more to do with identity and to do with um, getting older and l losing your um, your sense of um, belonging I guess you could call it. Um, so there was actually a lot more meat to the piece than I ever thought anyone would pick up on. Um, so I walked into the first meeting and said, don't get too excited. It's just about a pair of shoes. And that sort of became my mantra, um, that self-deprecating manager expectations. Um, and, you know, and everyone would kind of say, oh, Jen is downplaying it again this, you know, this month. But, you know, I just always, I never, I always thought they're not going to think anything of this, of, of this piece. So, so every month you went through a different chapter of your book? Well, the, Dino? not, not initially, it didn't start as a book and I didn't share with my coworkers, um, uh, my diagnosis of OCD until, you know, probably maybe even a year or a year and a half into the group. Um, but I was primarily doing sort of like these personal essay, short, um, blog-like um, quips about my day-to-day -day life. Um, and eventually I started um, uh, folding uh, my OCD diagnosis into those pieces um, because what I found out from my coworkers as we would discuss our pieces was that even though I found it to be very personal, per very personal and very much my own experience, everyone else found it very universal and very relatable. And so I thought to myself, well, I could start to expand on this and, um, you know, start to take a universal perspective on a very personal issue for me. Um, and so many of the pieces that um, were in the original manuscript and then in, in the final manuscript were skeletons. Um, very early drafts of um, uh, pieces that made it in, into the into the final book, um, but that wasn't the initial goal. Uh, I, through the support of, of of my coworkers, the other writers in the group, I 
realized that this was a project um, that um, that would be beneficial, both to me and 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 to those around me. So, how did the story that you are developing became a book? How did it become a book? Um, so I sort of fell into this um, into this contest, um, which I just discovered through um, on social media that they were advertising for it, and I was, you know, was in this place in this bucolic area of Vermont, and I thought, oh, that would be nice to be able to just get away and write. And what I didn't realize is that it was a um, a marketing experiment also to to vet people to participate in this contest called Pitch Week. Um, so over a period of two years, um, I developed the manuscript. I worked with a cover artist to come up with designs to present. Uh, I came up with a marketing strategy. There were a whole bunch of different categories that I was scored on. and. Um, that I had to work towards winning and ultimately if you win then you get a publishing contract as, as the prize so that was how it came to be published. <laughs> so uh, of all these many stories that you have in your book which is your favorite? Um, let me see I guess because it is still very relevant to me right now as a 40 early 40 something year old woman uh, restless motherhood syndrome which is about my my pondering my exploration my questioning of should I should I have kids and something I think that will um, resonate with your listeners uh, with your viewers is that one of my concerns is about the state of our planet right now and one of the things that I discuss in that chapter is would it be selfish for me to bring to bring a child into the world who may have to deal with the impact of climate change that's, um, that's one of and then I and then I talk very candidly about my concerns over whether I would pass um, any of my mental health issues onto my child and how would they would that be fair to them um, how would they cope with it would they or if they didn't have if you know how would they you know deal with my constant worry and my constant overanalyzing and perseverating, would that impact them? Would that cause them undue stress? And so would it be fair for me um, to have a child? And so then I talk about fostering and adopting and how that's undervalued, but how there are so many kids that would benefit from just having um, a good home and someone who, um, to, you know, to really nurture them. So I talk about that, and then I talk, and then, you know, I, I talk about, well, I start looking at some of my experiences taking care of my friend's kids you know, and taking care of a pet and sort of the, the mishaps that went along with that. And like, well, if I couldn't take care of a fish, how am I going to take care of a baby? <laughs> you know, so... And then, and then I start to, to honestly say, well, is anyone ever really prepared to have their first kid? No, they're not, never. So, and are, are, am I, would, I, would I make mistakes? Of course, every parent is going to make mistakes. So, again, that's why even though it's something that's very personal to me, it's very relatable. To, to readers. I would like to invite you to read us a few paragraphs. From that, from that piece? From that piece or what you consider um, the part that we want to share with so, our viewers? So I, sure, I will, I will share that piece. Uh, chapter 8, Restless Motherhood Syndrome. 
Do I want to have a child? How could I possibly? This is a question I ask myself every day. Each day, the answer changes based on my age, on how well I've managed to balance my checkbook that month, on how many kids whizzing by on their scooters have run over my foot without saying they're sorry. The answer changes based on the number of friends who after years of swearing up and down, they would never have kids, call to tell me they're about to have their second or their third, or the friends who have always wanted nothing more to, to have children, call to tell me they have just experienced their second or third miscarriage. My answer to this question is also impacted by how many natural disasters have occurred in the last six months. Signals that our planet is in peril and that we are even closer to a full-fledged crisis of global warming. The answer constantly changes. Fears keep me up, up at night that my kid will have to bear the burden of my disorder or that I will pass the symptoms of OCD directly on to him or her. In short, my answer changes as a result of any obsessive thought that envelops my head, body, and psyche in swirls of emotion and leaves me gasping for air. These thoughts are the effects of a rare disease that I call restless motherhood syndrome. There is no known treatment, though I'm sure if the pharmaceutical industry were to roll one out on the market, all the television networks would advertise without hesitation and the drug companies would make a killing. Symptoms include night sweats, biting your fingernails down to the nub until they blister and bleed, panic, delusion, recurring painful repressed memories from your own childhood, and a biological clock that never stops ticking. Do you want me to keep going or? Yeah, it's uh, very <laughs> compelling. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult world. Uh, where the, uh, the one we're living in. What is, what is your, what is coming next? So I am thinking about um, starting a regular week, uh, daily or weekly blog, which I would call the slog <laughs> to indicate how much we all have to slog through our lives for all the the daily challenges and also the daily begrudging situations that we have no choice but to endure and how to kind of rally through those challenges. Um, I want to focus more on the aspect of OCD for me, which is my struggles with intimacy, um, with relationships um, outside of family and friend relationships but romantic relationships um, I think that even though that is also something that's very personal I think that there will be enough universal appeal for that that it would work um, ultimately that is the next project that I would be thinking about working on and the working title right now is oh I'm sorry did you think you were having sex tonight so uh, so yeah that's that's it's in it's it's in the file drawer right now it's you know the 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 mental file drawer so to speak that I'm considering could you give uh, any advice to new writers have to go through this uh, scary process of yeah. trying to write? I mean, one of the things that I can say is that if it is slow going, it's not going, it's, uh, it's going to be there tomorrow. So go and take a walk and um, spend you know spend some time with your family it'll be there tomorrow and it'll be there the next day um, if you're not working under a deadline situation then there's no reason to push it um, and if you are writing something and it doesn't feel right at that particular time 
you never know what's going to come from from that. So don't underestimate the value of of what you're working on, even if it doesn't feel right to you at that time. You never know what it's going to develop into. Um, with that, um, with that message to the universe. And that, I mean, that's pretty much how I manage my life, <laughs> uh, how I manage my expectations, how I manage to make sure that I don't trigger from, from, from putting myself in a stressful situation, is just to take things very gradually. And just to say, and if, you're, if I'm going through a particularly stressful, challenging time or why is this happening to me sort of situation. Um, you know, that's where I'd say with each day it gets a little bit better. And the message of this book is how, is that humor is healing. Just to laugh, to laugh whenever you can as long as you designate it as the, at your discretion that you designate the situation to be appropriate. Laughing and finding the humor in, in your struggles is incredibly empowering um, and, and gives you strength that you didn't think you had in you. Um, so I really believe that humor is healing and you know, what I say when I do interviews is, if I can survive this, anybody can because um, you know, the, the, the goal of the book is that for people who are undiagnosed but who are maybe experiencing symptoms, it's to feel more inclined to come out of the shadows because what they are experiencing may be more common than they think. And again, if I can survive it, so can they. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ethan. Thank, thank you. Uh, one other question. Sure. Is uh, obsessive compulsion something that you've been able to get out of? Or is it something that you are always obsessed with? There are people who have successfully overcome who could almost, it could almost be undetectable. I, I have heard of it. I, I don't know. I, 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 I have heard of people having that, but I really think that it's just um, a long-term condition that you learn how to manage in your own way, that you learn your own coping, you develop your own coping mechanisms for. Um, I don't think it's unheard of. Um, I mean, for, for myself, uh, I am, have been working over the last few years to wean myself off of, med of being on medication to, um, through uh, a moderate exercise routine that I adhere to, to mindfulness meditation, um, to having an active social life, to being an activist and finding something that I'm passionate about that gives me drive um, and is also a distraction from what I might be obsessing over or having anxiety from. It gives you something else to focus on. Um, but I have heard of, of people reaching a point where it's almost undetectable for them. Um, so I think it's possible. Thank you. Thank you.